So welcome to the morning session. I'm Sonia Contera. I'm a biological physicist working actually in this building. My labs are upstairs. And I'm very pleased to be the chair of the morning session. And so we just start. We start with the first talk by Professor John Butterworth, who's coming from University College London, whose title is uh, Don't Argue, Just Make the Plot, Physics Controversies and How They Arise. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation to, to start your Saturday morning here. Um, so as you heard, I, I, my name is John Butterworth. I, you heard my subtitle. You'll see that I've played with my subtitle a little bit. Um, I'll explain why in a minute. Um, because um, this is a, an unusual talk to give. It's always nice, you, you know, as an academic, you give often variations on the same talk several times. This is a completely different one for me. Um, and it's been evolving as I thought about what I might want to say here. So just to give you some background, I'm a um, I'm a particle physicist, I'm a professional scientist at University College London. Um, I work on the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which is the, currently the world's highest energy particle beam. You may have um, seen it in the news a few years ago when we discovered the Higgs boson, and, and before that where we turned it on and, and it failed and then came back again and all that business. Um, this talk is not about that, although I think it's important background um, to know where I'm coming from. I, I'm head of department at UCL as well, Department of Physics and Astronomy, in a faculty that contains um, a department which is a mathematical and physical sciences um, faculty, but it contains a department of science and technology studies led by Professor Joe Kane. And having interacted with those people and Joe quite a lot, I know enough about history and philosophy of science to know how little I know about history and philosophy of science. So um, there's another reason why I'm treading a little carefully on, the, on, on um, ad addressing a meeting like this on scientific controversies and how they uh, arise. So when I was asked to do it, I thought, don't argue, just make the plot. That was the title which I stuck with and I, I will stand by, um, because that is a plea that is heard in, in Atlas and at UCL. You have two, one of the plagues of big science. There are 3,000 people on my experiment, at least. Um, don't ask how many work on my experiment, but there are 3,000 people on my experiment. Um, the, uh, and we have a lot of meetings. You have to spend a lot of time in discussions of various degrees of formality, and they get bogged down quite often into details um, that essentially are um, proxy wars between universities or proxy wars between different personalities. And in the end, you very often hear the cry, don't argue about this anymore, just go and make the plot. Um, and you say, well, a lot of scientific controversies can be answered that way. So I'll show you an example of some that, that can and have been, but I, I also thinking about it further then maybe more interesting is why do controversies then exist at all? If you can just go and get the data and, and um, solve them, then, then why, do, why, do we, why are controversies even controversial at all? Um, so what, I'll, I, what I'm going to do in this talk is take you through some different kinds of scientific controversies, maybe some of them bordering maybe not really on scientific and more, as I say, proxy wars for politics or for other things, but mostly trying to focus on the actual science of what's going on and why controversies, not so much just why they arise, but why they persist. If you can just go and make, get the data, why, why would a controversy even persist? So that's, that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, before the, my starting slide is, is actually one from a, a talk I gave recently at CERN at the... In, in, um, initiation of uh, the new CERN history project, which they've had a, they had a history project studying the history of the lab from its foundation up to the mid-90s. Um, and they want to re resuscitate that now and, and basically carry it on and maybe do some revisionism of the early bit as well, I guess, um, and, and see what happens. And I was asked to give a talk on the role of history in public engagement, because I do quite a lot of public engagement of science. I write for The Guardian and, and various other things sometimes, and I've written a couple of books. So this was a slide of, of random books with bits of history in that were on my bookshelf when I was going there. And the reason I'm showing it again here is because um, there's a book on here which is pretty controversial, and that's this one here, um, which is called Nobel Dreams. Um, it was written by a guy who got embedded in CERN in the 80s when the SPPRS was, was running to look for the W and the Z boson. And uh, he kind of, fairly advanced for his time, I guess. He, he worked very closely with the scientists, but he wasn't a scientist. And he only wrote a book which made a lot of them extremely angry, um, <laughs> particularly um, some of the more senior ones. Um, 
And it was, I found this book very entertaining, and, and you take it with a pinch of salt, and I'm, I'm sure there's, there's, there's definitely controversies in this book which are inaccurately reported. There are others which are um, probably quite accurate. Um, but the, inter the reason I'm showing it here is that the controversy about this book persists. It was banned from the CERN library, and when I showed it in a slide at CERN, I was pulled aside afterwards and said, you know that book's banned here? Uh, so... <laughs> so so um, controversies have, they, ca they carry on and, and, and actually the interesting thing about this is it wasn't even a scientific controversy in the end. The book recounts various scientific controversies but in the end does, the dust has settled. CERN won the Nobel Prize, um, uh, Van der Meer and Rubio won the Nobel Prize for discovering the, uh, the W and the Z boson and there's no controversy in that at all. It was a wonderful experiment that succeeded but yet this book is still a sore spot with some people. Um, so, scientific controversies, um, often about the scientists as well as about the science, I guess. But here's an example of a, uh, which uh, some, I think there are a few Atlas collaborators and CMS collaborators in the, the room who will recognize this plot. This is an example where the answer is just make the plot, stop arguing. So what I'm showing you here is, is data from the Atlas and CMS experiments, which are two, the two general purpose detectors on the Large Hadron Collider. Um, the two that discovered the Higgs boson. And these plots were made in our from our first data at a new energy scale at 13 tera electron volts. So that's the center of mass energy of about 13,000 times the mass of the proton. And what you see here is, is the mass, the invariant mass of pairs of photons. And for those of you who were really paying attention to the Higgs discovery, um, this will be, that'll, that'll set a little bell ringing because the invariant mass of the pairs of photons um, is exactly the plot that the Higgs boson was discovered in. Okay? So if you produce a new particle, it behaves like a resonance in a, in a bump. So you'll see uh, if you count the number of particles, the number of pairs of photons, for instance, and you measure their invariant mass of that pair, then if there's a new particle being produced, you'll see an enhancement in the probability, enhancement in the number of collisions that at, at a particular mass. And that was exactly what we saw off the bottom of this plot at 125 times the mass of the proton, roughly, 125 GeV, um, which was a statistically significant bump, which, which was evidence that we were producing Higgs bosons and that they were decaying to pairs of photons, and that was the compelling evidence that we declared on, on, on in the summer of 2012 um, that, that has, was interpreted and still is as the um, discovery of the Higgs boson. So when we see another bump in this plot, we obviously as you get more energy, you can make the invariant mass um, plot up to higher and higher energies. And as you collect more data, the statistical uncertainties will shrink. These, these black points here are the, error, are the data and the, the bars are indicating the statistical uncertainty. And this red line is a sort of background fit estimating what would happen if there were no bumps there. Okay. So you see what we were getting a little bit excited on Atlas because there may be something going on here. There seems to be a tendency of three points at least clustered together that are above this background that could be a bump beginning to emerge from the background noise. Okay? On its own, we probably wouldn't have got terribly excited. Um, on the other hand, we look at our colleagues across the ring, and the plot is presented in a different way here, but this, is, this along this axis is still the mass, the same mass that's here, just plotted on a logarithmic scale. <coughs> and there's this dip here, which is essentially at the point that this bump is here, and this dip is a dip in the probability that the distribution is, is compatible with the background. So they're expressing the same data in a different way. The key point is that at this point, around 750 GeV, both Atlas and CMS see something that looks like it might be a bump emerging from the noise. So is that really controversial? Well, yeah, because you can argue about the statistical interpretation of that. If you look at the low... The, the, the local significance of that it was quite high. This was more, more than three sigma, and depending how you interpreted it, you could get it higher. On the other hand, we make a lot of plots, so some of them are bound to have bumps and fluctuations in them. So how seriously do you take a given bump? Um, from an experimental point of view, the um, answer is don't argue, just make the plot and collect more data, and sadly the bump went away. So this is the same data, but now with three times as much, same plots, but with now three times as much data, and the bump sadly has not grown, it has receded into the noise. And this is, you, you, know, you would have heard about this if it had stayed around. We were very <laughs> excited when it happened. So that's, that's an example of my title, if you like. You know, don't, there's not much point speculating about a, a bump like that. Just go and collect more data and let's see what happens. 
That's all the experimentalists do. Meanwhile, the theorists wrote about a thousand papers explaining what the bump was, but there we are. <laughs> um, okay, so that's, uh, that's an example of when my kind of thesis, my title, does sort of work. Um, this is another one where the theorists come out maybe uh, looking uh, okay as well. Um, this, this, is a, this is a preprint that's on the, on the um, archive in January, actually, and there's a recent little flurry of uh, speculation and, and controversy about this. So what's going on here is, is uh, I'll, I'll explain the title in a minute, but um, the context here is that there's an experiment which actually UCL are involved in um, at Fermilab, um, which is dedicated to collecting lots and lots of muons, which are basically, for those of you who are not physicists, they're the heavy heavy particle that's very like an electron, um, collecting lots and lots of muons, putting them in a magnetic uh, a ring, um, stored storage ring with magnets, and um, watching how they process in the magnetic field and measuring their, um, their magnetic dipole. And the reason for this is that the magnetic, um, the magnetic moment. So the magnetic moment of an electron is, is the kind of poster child of precision quantum field theory. It has, it's, it's the, the theory and the calculate and the measurement are done to something like one part in, I think, eight billion, something, I can't remember the, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's several, it's about eight decimal places. It's a ridiculously long number that agrees in every digit. Um, and, uh, and that has lots of quantum loop corrections in it, and, it, and it's, um, it's the, the kind of tour de force for precision quantum field theory calculations and precision um, particle physics measurements, and it works and it agrees. When you do the same thing with the muon, it's not quite as precise because muons decay and they're harder to store and, and you don't get as many of them, but you find a discrepancy in the last few digits at around three sigma, just a bit over three sigma significance, which means uh, if you use the p-value, the p-value of something like um, uh, 0.02 or something, if I remember rightly, um, which is enough to get interested, but not enough to tell you that your calculation or your experiment are definitely wrong. And in any case, one measurement and one calculation are never enough. So the calculations being done over and again by many people. The experiment is being done again. This, the, the one that gave that discrepancy was done at Brookhaven in the US. The, they then moved the whole magnet right across the United States in a very counterintuitive way because they went all the way south and then back up the Mississippi to Chicago. And, um, and they know, they know because Chicago uh, is Fermi, it was where Fermilab is, and they have more muons. So they can use the same magnets, but put more muons in it and get a more, more precise measurement. And in the middle of all this, or just about when they ta started taking data, some theorists put out a thing saying, oh, we don't need to bother with this because we found the source of the discrepancy. And it's because you didn't take general relativity into account, into account. And the Earth is a sphere, and it's in, your, your uh, muons are in a, in a non-in-flat uh, non space. They're in a curved space time because of... Um, because of the Earth's gravitational field. And, um, and so this caused a little bit of a disturbance. As you can imagine, we've been working on this experiment for quite a long time to track down an anomaly. And while in principle, you might say, well, you know, that just because a theorist does another calculation should, doesn't make the measurement not worthwhile. And, and yeah, in principle, that's true. But if you're going to chase down an anomaly, you'd rather be the person to either resolve it or or prove that it's there and not have, it, have the rug pulled from under you just as you're about to make the measurement. Now it turns out, um, I, I, this is still somewhat live I think, but it, uh, there was a very rapid response from the experiments saying these theorists are wrong. Um, and there, it seems to be, there, there's been a number of actually uh, takedowns of this paper, some of which are actually not correct as far as I know, but I think the, certainly the one that convinces me is, is um, first of all, I, the, there's a claim that they've actually they've, they've misunderstood, misapplied general relativity, which I'm not really qualified to say. Um, I haven't read the paper carefully enough to know whether that's true, and I've heard people argue one way or the other. But what I do know is that the correction that they applied is, to a, very, is a correction to a very small correction uh, uh, in the experiment. And in fact, even if they were right in the calculation of the size of the effect of general relativity, it would not explain the 3.2 sigma. So it seems like this, was, uh, this is an example of not so much the plots work, but the calculations work. And I think there's a symmetry there. If you, if you very, what I mean by you know, a controversy, just go, don't argue, just make the plot. You, you can say, just do a better experiment, and that will resolve the controversy. Or you can say, just do a better calculation and get more people to check it, and that will resolve the controversy. So that's why I'm showing this one. I don't mean to bring these guys into disrepute. I think it's a sensible enough paper, a sensible enough thing to try. 
but I think the consensus that's already emerged in, in the last month is that, they haven't, that you need a better calculation. This is not the right calculation to have done. So those are two examples of controversies that, that, um, that do, um, where, where the title of the talk does work, don't argue, just make the plot, or, or just don't argue, just do the calculation, does work. There are others where it's less clear, but the plot is still important. Um, this, is a, this is a plot from Nick Ellis, who's, who's a trigger coordinator on my experiments, from 2006 when we were... Um, I don't know why this is Manchester here, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, I think it's probably his, maybe his talk. Um, the, uh, this is a plot from 2006, before the, which is a significant date, before it was the Large Hadron Collider was due to turn on in two years' time, um, and indeed did turn on briefly in two years' time um, after that. And this, th what this plot is showing you is the amount of data we expect to get from the Large Hadron Collider. Okay? So, it's, and it's, you know, it's not, I realise it's not a particularly uh, intuitive way of displaying it, but maybe the, the most intuitive thing up here, especially for non-physicists, is, is this, um, the rate up here. This is in hertz, the number, <coughs> the number of collision events of a particular type per second that you're expecting to get when you collide beams at the Large Hadron Collider. And you see that the, to the total number of proton-proton collisions that you get is in the gigahertz um, level. But if you want to look at something like the Higgs boson, standard model Higgs, which we, we, didn't, we didn't know the mass of it or, we didn't, or anything then, it's before we discovered it, but all the predictions were this rate were down, was down here in the millihertz. And the level, and, and even more important, is, is the fact that the, um, only the data that you can only store in your, the first part of your data selection is, is only here in a few, is a few um, tens of megahertz. And the maximum data that you can even write to persistent storage, so in, in any form and keep and look at later, um, is, is a few tens of hertz, or hundreds of hertz. So what I, the controversy I'm trying to get out there is you make a decision when you turn on the beam, you're going to throw a lot of your data away. And there's a, controversy, there's a discussion then about, okay, what's the important data to keep? And what you decide to keep will have a strong influence on what you actually do, what you measure, and what, how you do the experiment. You, make, you can make some very general principles. Well, we'll keep all the ones where the protons hit each other full on and we'll ignore the glancing collisions because we've seen loads of those before anyway. And, and those kind of, we'll, ignore, we'll look at the ones that produce pairs of photons like that so we can make that plot and see if there's a bump in it. So you, you devise selection and rejection algorithms on, along, that, um, along that line. And a lot of that is not at all controversial, but some of it is. At some point, someone says, well, I think this is the most important thing to measure. And someone else says... I think this is, and you say, well, we can't fit them both in the data rate, so one of you is going to have to compromise. One of you will not get the data as fast as you want, maybe, is probably what happens in the end. So the plots clearly help in that you, you need to, they frame the discussion in that you need, you need, the, you need the estimates and you need the data on, on what the rate will be and how, much of those, how many of those events can you keep and what the constraints on the controversy really are. But they don't resolve the controversy because there's a subjective judgment in there as to what you think the most important physics is and what you should be spending your bandwidth on and what you should be spending your data storage on. Okay, so another case where the, the plots um, are vital but don't resolve the controversy completely um, is also related to the beginnings of the LHC but actually further back in time. And I've, been, I've taken the liberty of... Uh, of photographing a page from one of my books here, um, sorry, but it's because it's, a, it's, a, I, it's where I said what I wanted to say about this anyway. So in the, um, at the end of the 90s, we, in the tunnel that the Large Hadron Collider is now in, um, we had the Large Electron-Positron experiment, which was an electron-positron beam instead of what is now a proton-proton beam. Um, that was colliding um, particles at the highest energy that we'd had at that date um, for electrons and positrons. Um, and it was due to be turned off because it had done its studies of the Z boson in lap one and then, and then they pushed the energy as high as they can. And the, there's a different um, limit. The thing that limits the energy of a beam is different in the case of electrons and in the case of protons. So with electrons and positrons, because they're rather light, the limit in the end on how high energy you can get is on the amount of radio frequency and um, acceleration you can pump in, so the power you can pump in. Uh, because, um, because they're light, electrons and positrons emit synchrotron radiation around, as they go around the ring. So those of you who know Diamond, which is up the road at Howell, will know that synchrotron radiation can be very useful for studying 
um, material structures and things. But from a particle physics point of view, it's wasted energy because as, it, as they go around the ring, they're losing energy. And you, in the end, you reach a point where you're pumping all the energy in you can, and it's all leaking out on the curves, and you've reached then the maximum energy of that beam. Okay? And that's where LEP2 was. It, it got to... It got to um, Central mass energies are right at 115 GeV, and, and it couldn't go any further. And they were really running it into the ground, in fact. They were really, you know, at any point, it could fail because the, everything was being turned up to, to, to 11 to try and make it work. And the reason was that they thought that there might be, the, the Higgs boson might be there, and they were hoping to get the Higgs boson. And there was a race on because the Tevatron in the United States at Fermilab was the uh, proton-antiproton machine that had a chance of finding the Higgs boson as well. Um, and in the end, um, so it was around 115 GV, and there were hints. So the, there was, this is a plot from um, this, um, pa this review paper by Gunter de Satori, who's on CMS now, about the prehistory of the Higgs search, if you like, before, before it was discovered. And this is a key plot from the Aleph experiment, one of the four experiments on, on the LEP um, machine. And again, it's another center of mass energy plot looking for a bump. It's not that particle physics is quite simple once you realize what, what you're looking for bumps in distributions. Um, and uh, you see that they're running out of energy here. And this is what they think might be a Higgs boson signal here. Um, and you can see the size of the error bars, and it's not very convincing. Um, but it's, this was being presented in CERN council meetings and, and, um, and review boards and things saying, now, give us another year. Just give us another year, and we'll, we'll make these errors. We'll make the plot, and then we'll know. And you but you didn't have the luxury of that, because if you waited another year, all the contracts you, you put out to build the Large Hadron Collider, and all the people who were waiting to do the data from the, analyze the data from the Large Hadron Collider, would be, well, the contracts would cost you loads of money, so CERN would have a huge hit on its budget for if it decided to delay the LHC further for this. Plus... Um, the people, you know, there were a whole bunch of people waiting, not me at the time, but there were a whole bunch of people waiting to, uh, to work, who'd been working on the LHC and were expecting to start actually installing it and getting it going. And you had to make a value judgment. You had these plots, you had similar plots from, from the other three experiments, you put it all together, you, but in, you know, the plots helped, but, and they set the context for the controversy, and it was very controversial. You can imagine people spent their whole careers working on these experiments, and they felt they were just about to make the biggest discovery of, that the experiment could have possibly have made and they might be told to turn off because of this stupid new experiment that was going to go in the tunnel. Other people say, well, I've been working 10 years getting the Large Hadron Collider ready. Even if this is a Higgs boson, it'll be right on the edge of what we do, and we won't be able to discover it. And then, as you know, but what if the Americans beat us to it, and how, how silly would CERN feel if, the Amer if they turned it off, and then the Americans found it was right there at 115 GV. Anyway, um, actually, one of your um, senior colleagues here, Roger Cashmore, was research director of CERN at the time and was instrumental in the decision to turn it off. Right, good decision, because the Higgs was 10 GeV further away. This was nothing to do with the Higgs. Um, and we, it was quite a moment on Atlas when we ruled out 115 GeV Higgs, because some of our senior physicists had been on the previous experiment and then, of course, moved to the LHC because you're looking for the Higgs. Um, and we're totally convinced, as I said, in the, in, if you were reading a bit of paper before, they were totally convinced that actually they'd seen the Higgs already, and all the LHC had to do was go and confirm it was really there at 114 GeV, and it wasn't. It was 125. So they could never have seen it with this machine, and it was a good decision, but it was a judgment call, it was controversial, I, and, and, you know, this, this is, I'm giving you examples of where the plots don't always just resolve the matter automatically. Okay, another thing that can go wrong is you can have the wrong plot. Um, so this is a, a con this is a scientific controversy from, I think, last year, if I remember rightly, um, where um, the group um, on um, BICEP, which is an experiment um, in the Antarctic, if I remember rightly, BICEP 2, in fact, was looking for, um, for twists in the, the um, electromagnetic spectrum, um, polarization twists, which these are supposed to illustrate, which would be um, a telltale sign of primordial gravitational waves from the Big Bang. Um, they're called B modes, um, but they'd never been seen before. They, they were... Um, their observation was, would, would have been very compelling further evidence for the theory of inflation. Um, they thought they'd seen them. They published, they put a thing out on, on uh, they, uh, well, actually what they did was they had a press conference and they went and, and interviewed all the theorists who predicted inflation and said, isn't it great, we found it. And um, there was a certain amount of rivalry, I think, going on between Harvard and Princeton at the time. Um, 
probably still is. To put it kindly, there, there, was a, there, there was, or looking at, I mean, I'm a complete outsider on this, so I, I, the way it looked to me, I guess, and, and the people who were involved, more involved may, may, may disagree, because that's the nature of scientific controversies. Um, but there, there's, there are other backgrounds that can give you these twists, one of which is the dust in the galaxy around us. The Planck experiment, which is one of these big collaborations, big project, was making very precise measurements of this, ba of this dust, of this background. Um, they'd shown a, some of this preliminary results of this in a talk, and apparently Bicep grabbed the PowerPoint slide from the talk and, and used that for their background subtraction, and it was wrong. And there was clearly some race going on, because in, if you want to... The, if, I, I don't, now, I don't want to characterize the Bicep people with, with these... Um, with these motors, but I think it's an illustration of, of something that's worth bringing up. At some level, the person who measures last gets the credit, right? Because if you're looking for a new signal and you measure the background, you, you, get, you characterize these twists and you say, these are the ones from the local galaxy, and you measure that. Um, and then someone else says, and we've measured the primordial ones as well, and we subtract the two, and look, hey, we've got a Nobel Prize. Um, it could, if you've done it the other way around, and someone says, well, I've measured the total um, signal, and then someone says, and now we've characterized the background so we can subtract it and show that here is the, the, whoever comes second gets the prize because it's the, the subtraction of the two that really works. And I think there was some of this going on. I think there was some gamesmanship going on, and it actually failed because it, was the, it turns out that when you did do the, when you got the full Planck data, the signal wasn't significant and went away. So this is still... Um, I don't know how controversial the bicep result is still, it's, it itself was, but the, the observation or not of, of primordial gravitational waves certainly is, an, a live issue, is a live issue, and we'll see whether, it, whether they're there. We still don't know. So that's a, a, another example of where, well, the plot doesn't work if it's the wrong plot, I guess, is the, the, the summary of that. Now, the, the next thing I, that I want to talk about is, is um, this is something I actually read because I was giving this talk, because I, I was I, it actually it passed through my Facebook feed, in fact, and I thought, oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. This is a really nice example of a of a scientific controversy that has been resolved, um, but it lasted a long time. This is the, the original data is from 1925, and the um, preprint that resolved it is from 2006. And those of you who are fans of um, ether drift. And, and michelson morley experiments and things might already know what this is and recognize it. Because apparently, although I, I hadn't come across it before, the, these data um, from Dayton Miller's... Um, spec it was basically an, a, a, an improvement of the michelson morley experiment that was taken up in a mountain because he felt that the ether drift would be faster up a mountain if it was happening. Um, and, and he was trying to measure... The way he phrased it, he was trying to measure the absolute motion of the Earth. So he was trying to see if there was some... Um, luminous for us, ether that we were, we were moving through, that um, if you did an experiment on the Earth, the ether was moving with the Earth, so you didn't see any anomalous mo motion, of the, you didn't see any absolute motion, and you therefore verified Einstein's special relativity, because, which is what Michelson Morley did. They saw that the speed of light didn't depend on the angle of their spectrometers. Um, but um, Dayton Miller, who was a really very well-respected and excellent um, experimentalist, did a, with a direct descendant of their experiment with some improvements, although apparently he used the same mercury bath that they'd floated their, their experiment in, which is not relevant to the controversy, but just interesting that mercury baths were obviously a, a difficult thing to get hold of. Um, and he, he did this measurement, and these are his original data, and there, there's a, a bunch of things in here. I, I urge you to go and have a look at this if you're interested. Um, the data were... It, what, what he was doing was he had, a, had a, this spectrum... Spect spectrometer and he would turn it and, and be walking around it and measuring the fringes and the point is that if the path length of the light changes is because the speed of the light changes then you'll see a drift in the fringes and he was measuring that and he got a lot he got huge data sets he knew he got much bigger data sets than, than Michelson Morley and he was also doing it up a mountain because he felt that the the, it, the, high, the further you got away from the earth you might actually see more, the, the ether drift wouldn't be as strong. It wouldn't be as strongly tied to the Earth, so you would have more, more chance of seeing the movement. And he saw a sinusoidal signal. This is, this is it here, which would have been the signature that Einstein was wrong, um, that, that actually the, he'd measured the absolute motion of the Earth, which is something you can't do in special relativity. And he engaged with Einstein uh, in the controversy. Um, apparently, it fell, the, the, the discussion, Einstein agreed that if this was a correct measurement, then special relativity was wrong. And... Uh, and then at the end of that debate, 
was when Einstein muttered something about temperature systematics and, and as an experimentalist, Dayton Miller quite understandably blew up and said, you know, if you think I don't control my systematics, you theorist, you, um, and uh, stopped engaging with Einstein. Um, and, uh, and it sat there for a long time, and it's used by people who think Einstein was wrong and, 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 or, or want to prove Einstein was wrong. It's used a lot as the one anomalous measurement that doesn't agree with all the others that, that show that special relativity is right. Anyway, th so this um, paper here by Thomas Roberts is, is fascinating in, in several ways in terms of, um, of controversies in science. The first thing is that he managed to reanalyze all of data and Miller's data. Now that, that's a real lesson to us on big particle physics experiments and big astrophysics experiments. Open data recorded for that long, okay, that you, the fact that he'd recorded, he'd written the paper well enough and recorded the data well enough that this guy could go and reconstruct everything he'd done. And that includes some very complex and um, well and thoroughly described corrections to the data to allow for systematic drifts in the temperature, for instance, and in various other observational effects. It's all there. Um, and so he was, um, Thomas Roberts was able to go and do this and apply current day statistical and digital signal processing techniques to these data, which were just written down in, in, on, in the notebooks there. They were in the, in the archive at Case Western University. The, the auxiliary material for the paper was all there. And, um, and he applied and he found uh, um, that essentially if you, the, the, the techniques that... Um, that had been used by Dayton Miller. He'd averaged over um, circuits and things, and he, and he had, in the end had an effect of suppressing all the noise in his experiment, uh, all the frequencies. So he'd done a, a Fourier analysis of, 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 going, of each rotation of these, th this stuff. And he'd, he'd ended up the, saying that if he had any noise in his system that had a falling frequency, a falling amplitude with frequency, then the lowest frequency um, that survived would be the highest, and he suppressed all frequencies lower than half a turn, and all the higher ones were falling. So he got a peak at half a turn, which is exactly the sinusoidal thing here. So, and it was the, the, digi the digital signal processing techniques and the statistical techniques that Thomas Roberts used were not just not available in 1926. It wasn't known. But the data, so this is no disrespect to Dayton Miller because he'd done the job as well as you possibly could do it in the day. Not only that, he had recorded all the data in such a way that later on they could be reanalyzed with an up-to-date analysis and actually this goes away and you find it's completely flat. So, so scientific controversy, sometimes you make the best plot you can, but if you record the data, then someone else will make a better one later. Okay, so I'm pretty much at the end of my time and pretty much finished. Um, so when do the plots not work? When the scientific controversies survive the plot, which are the most interesting ones. So I would say... When you're deciding what to do next, the plots don't always work. They, they can give you, they're important, but they don't necessarily give you an uncontroversial answer. What I haven't done here, and maybe this will be touched on later, um, maybe by our summariser at the end of the day, is that um, I've stuck to the science. Um, there are many arguments in science which border on unscientific, or uh, say that unscientific is a bit of a pejorative term, but they, they can't be even addressed entirely by science, never mind the plot. We appeal to aesthetics in our theories very often, and, and you know, ideas like naturalness and fine-tuning, um, and you know, the, the, the anthropic principle and all this kind of stuff. I've deliberately stayed away from that because I, 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 well, I wanted to focus on that, what I considered the cases of actual scientific controversies. I'm not saying these are not interesting, and I, I think other speakers will cover them. But, and they're very live. You know, how much weight do you put on the fact that it seems that you have to fine-tune the Higgs mass to one part in 10 to the 17 to make the standard model work. Well, you put a lot of weight on it in some contexts. In other contexts, if you think, if you follow the anthropic principle, you say, well, if, we, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here, and therefore it's, it's obvious that it has to be that. And these, these arguments go back and forth, especially when the string theorists tell us we live in one of 10 to the 500 possibilities of the, uh, that would be mathematically consistent, and maybe we've selected the only one that has physicists in it. Um, <laughs> The, um, and then uh, there are the other kind of, this, this is a sort of naturalness kind of argument. There's also then arguments about things like, uh, particularly the interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is, there's a, a really nice book coming out soon by Philip Ball on this. I, it's become um, 
it was kind of put to bed. There was this kind of shut up, don't argue about this, just calculate, which is the kind of, I guess, just make the plot, don't argue about the interpretation, just do the calculation. Calculations really worked. I already described the, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, which is, is a hugely precise thing. How can you argue about the interpretation of a theory that gives you an accurate result to that level of precision? Well, you can, actually. And as you're building larger coherent systems and trying to make computers work, um, quantum computing work, for instance, maybe some of the arguments about do we, is the many worlds interpretation, how does coherence develop and, fo and fall apart, um, is the Copenhagen interpretation really an interpretation at all? It's certainly not just one interpretation, there's many of them. Um, so all of those things are scientific, science-related controversies that are not amenable always, unless you're a genius like Bell, for instance, maybe, um, to just making the plot. Um, and then I'll just finish with, of course, we're talking about scientific controversies and how they arise. Um, the other time that they're not answered by just making the plot is when people really aren't interested in the data. And they, this is an entertaining video, which I'm not going to play. Um, but the classic example, of course, is climate science. And this is Brian Cox on a TV program in, uh, in Australia addressing a climate skeptic claiming to be a scientist who, um, who was saying there was a, a talking about the pause in, in global warming. And Brian had the plot and showed him the plot and said, look, you've focused on a tiny bit here where two points are next to each other, but if you look at the trend, you can see the data. Doesn't work. Didn't convince him at all. The plot doesn't, <laughs> the plot doesn't work because the guy's not interested in the plot. He's, he, he believes climate science is a, is a hoax and therefore um, will brush off any data that, um, that, that contradicts that. I think the, I mean, it's still good that Brian did this, and I think that what, what you can do with the plot is you can remove scientific credibility from your political opponents so you can stop them claiming to be scientific but in the end they'll just say well the science is wrong then isn't it and I don't believe in global warming anyway so you, you, the plot will not work in the end um, for everyone but it will of course work for some of the audience of this TV program and certainly did um, okay and I think then I'm finished uh, with my talk That's, thank you Thank you. Listening to you, I realize why I always love coming back to the physics department after I collaborate with biologists, <laughs> uh, which is um, we, we, the, the culture of controversy in physics is so important for, for intellectual rigor that uh, really sometimes is lacking in our colleagues in other departments. Um, okay, so... I didn't say that. I say that, because I've been suffering for this for the last 18 years of my life, um, which was sometimes science can be very dogmatic and, and a way to, to do away with dogma is, is controversy. Okay, uh, so we have uh, almost 15 minutes for questions and, and, and answers. Yes. Uh, yeah, I've just um, oh, two questions. One, the second one's going to be about the book you just mentioned. Um, the first question is that the BICEP2 um, results, when they came out, I was quite closely monitoring that. It was quite interesting what was going on. Um, and I noticed the BICEP2 team themselves, in their own defence, were saying, look, these are the results we get. And they were stronger than they perhaps should have been. I think the levels were too high, mm -hmm. or, or, the, uh, or the level of the um, data was too, too indicative. And that, so they put, I, I understood it, they put the data out there saying, look, you know, these are the results. We recognise we haven't done a quite right frequency range. Uh, it could be dust, but this is what we think. Please knock us down, was the impression I got. Then I got the impression there was a brother group of people who jumped in on it and said, oh, this is primordial gravitational waves, great. No, it's not dust. And then suddenly it became out to be dust. So my impression of what happened there was that actually the BICEP2 in their defence were quite um, careful about the way they presented their data, unless you saw it a different way than I did. Yeah, I, I, I think there's some truth in that, in that very often these collaborations are in their official communications conservative and correct, because mm. those things go through committees and they approve. Um, and I've seen this with experiments I've worked on where we put out anomalies, even, even the 750 GV thing. We, yeah. the, the Atlas of CMS papers were absolutely conservative and correct. Yeah. Nevertheless, what was being said in conferences and things, uh, yeah. it's still a bit of press, didn't it? The, yeah, the, the yeah that's right. And, at yeah. some level, there's no harm in that. I'm, I'm actually yeah, yeah. not, not a, um, I'm not a fan of, of covering these things up until we know the answer. I think yeah. it's good to show the public the sausage factory, the you know science actually in operation, yeah. and, and, see, and not just giving them the whole final answer once we know it. I think where, from my taste, where the biceps two people crossed the line is first of all the results were preliminary in a way that was not 
but it was it was about it was this business of getting stealing not stealing getting preliminary results from another experiment and putting them in a paper which you're then claiming might be final and I think that's out of order. I yeah. mean, that certainly would annoy at the CMS enormously if we did that to each other. Um, and the other is just the PR that went with it, that they had a, a they did a good press conference. Now that probably wasn't that wasn't everyone on Bicep Two was but probably wasn't happy with that. Yeah. It was, you know, that's I'm not tiring everyone with the same brush. Yeah. But it was a subset of the collaboration that went out and were clearly staking claim for priority on what they were confident <coughs> would be a Nobel Prize winning discovery and they went and interviewed Alan Bluff in his living room and all this kind of stuff. And I thought that was a bit out of order if you were then going to claim Oh, but we said it was preliminary, kind of thing. Well, yeah, okay. Well, yeah. don't do the press conference until you're sure then. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it's, it's, but I'm sure that I know there are people in Bicep too who are very happy about that. And I think the official communications from the collaboration were probably much more scientifically rigorous. Yeah. That was my memory, yeah. Oh, quick one. What was the, uh, was that Marty, uh, Colin Ball you mentioned? That book on Philip the, Ball. Philip Ball. Philip Ball, and it's called Beyond Weird. Beyond Weird. Thank yeah, you. and it's very good. Hi. Um, hello. I, I've been long telling a story about the uh, about the Higgs boson experiment, and I'm going to probably find out that it's a terribly erroneous story, and I'll probably have to stop telling it, even though it's quite funny. Um, but I I wondered if you could put me right. If I remember rightly, there was one group of theorists who were saying that um, they were expecting results at 100 giga electron volts, and there was another group of theorists that said that it was going to be 150 giga electron volts. And my, I always said, well, it was about a 50-50 split in the theoretical <laughs> physicists, and then, miraculous dia, the, the results came at 125, uh, which I've always used as an, uh, to, to show that uh, the universe makes, it, makes itself up as it goes along, just to <laughs> fit in with what theoretical physicists say, uh, or rather to <laughs> possibly show that they're, uh, they're all wrong. So was there any truth in those results, or those, those initial uh, expectations? I, I'm not aware of a, something that clear cut where there was Two, basically two main camps and, and 100 and 150 now. Um, although there were so many theorists saying so many things, I'm sure there were two groups somewhere saying that at some point. Um, what, the, what there was that I'm aware of is, is that um, there, there's a very popular ex, uh, um, extension of the standard model called supersymmetry, and, and that made an initial prediction that the Higgs boson should be about 100 dB or a bit below in fact. Um, so that might be one of the things. And then they um, the people did um, correct higher order corrections to that theory um, at the same time as we were ruling out the predictions of the theory. But well, there we are. Um, and the, the mass crept up, and, it, and in the end, there was a kind of hard limit that it had to be about, I think it was 140 rather than 150. And if it had been above that, they would have, well, they would have had to do something else to keep supersymmetry alive. Because, um, on the face of it, that it was a prediction, you would say, that it, it was between about 100 and 140. We did from supersymmetry. And the, the big fans of supersymmetry will ignore the fact that we haven't found any supersymmetry particles and say, but we predicted the Higgs mass to within 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's still going on. That, that may be where that comes from. But I'm not, I don't remember there being a face off between 100 and 150 as two distinct groups. It might be that that you remember yeah. this, this low mass prediction from Susie and then it creeping up to 150. Did anyone get a prediction right on 125? Any, any oh, yeah, I knew it. <laughs> you know, you can predict it quite accurately by saying the sum of the square masses of the bosons has to be the same as the sum of the square masses of the fermions, and you get it to within GDB, but no one can know why. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm interested to hear your opinion on the standardization of the use of confidence, like a confidence interval. So. The significance level. Yeah. Uh, so I know in particle physics we're looking for five sigma signals. Is there a need to make a formal tool of when we say this controversy can now be settled? Three sigma is not enough. Or yeah, I, I think the most important thing about a convention like that is that there is a convention actually that you declare before your experiment what your criteria will be for discovery or not. You can still be wrong, of course. I mean, you can still your criteria can be wrong. But it's much less susceptible to be to, to drift. You know, if, if you if you say at the beginning we will declare a discovery at five sigma and we'll publish evidence at three sigma, which is essentially the convention in particle physics, then it's much better than, than nothing. Okay. Even if you could argue that three sigma and five sigma are the wrong numbers or even sigma is not the right language to characterize it, but you still better to have a convention than no convention. Okay. It, frame, it frames the discussion, it allows people to, to evaluate things against each other. Um, 
I I think um, I, th I think th those are quite high thresholds in particle physics, and I think that's correct because we measure a lot of things. And we have very good theory that describes most of them, and so if you measure, as you know, if you measure a thousand things, and some of them will only be a one in a thousand chance probably. Um, so you have to. You have to, it's basically a, a noise suppression. It's a zero suppression thing. And it doesn't mean that if we could, I've seen discoveries declared at five sigma in the bicep thing for seven sigma. But um, the, the uh, if I remember right. Um, so it's not infallible, but it's better to do it that way. I, I do worry that I see a lot, of, um, a lot of measurements, not so much in particle physics, that are, are much lower levels of probability. And when you see people making decisions on on behaviour and on things that matter to people's lives on the basis of much lower significance, it worries me enormously, and even more when the thing isn't reproducible. And I think this is there is a, there is a real controversy there about p value 0.05, which seems to be a standard in, in outside of physics, which is three sigma, right? So, I, I, is it just two sigma? Yeah, it's two sigma, isn't it? Good grief. See, that, that, now, now, in some ways, that's that's terrible because there seems to be a culture in some areas of science that you can't publish unless you've got that, which is stupid because you should publish null results as well. Uh, otherwise, you're enhancing <laughs> all anomalies automatically. Um, but the other is that you should acknowledge p-value of 0.05 as being what it is. It's an indication. It's not an incontrovertible um, discovery or something. So I think it's an amazing. That's an example of, of, a, of a convention that probably should change. And um, the, the other thing is. Whether we talk about look elsewhere effects and global and local significance and all that kind of stuff, and it gets very fuzzy at the edges and difficult to manage. It's not, it's not easy, but I, I, I'll just come back to my first point. At least they have a convention, it's reasonably high threshold, and it can at least frame a debate, but it doesn't end the debate. Um, I've really got a question about public perceptions of controversies in science. I'm a physics teacher and I've been for a number of years. And about 10 to 15 years ago, there was a move in the GCSE exam boards to introduce a lot more how science works and also to try and get young people engaged in this idea of not immediately believing the Daily Mail headline, but how you weigh up pros and cons. Yeah. And then in the most recent round of rejigging, yet again, of the exams, that seems to have been lost rather, with, and I think partly that's been driven by the universities of seeing a lack of academic rigour mm. because there's only so much time available. I just wondered where, where, where you <coughs> thought our balance should lie on that. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think it was, it's a noble idea. I'm not sure it should be done necessarily in science classes. They do um, personal social health education and stuff, and a, a lot of it is going there, actually. Yeah, My I wife is actually a chemistry teacher. Well, I'm a physics teacher, obviously, as well. But my wife's a chemistry teacher at, at, at um, 11 to 18. And she expressed great impatience in the other, some of the surfaces where they'd be having lessons in science on genetic modification, and they haven't even done cells. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just that, to me, that, that is, that, that doesn't mean you can't have discussion on GM foods, but to pretend it's in science, I think it's not. It's in politics, it's in, in politics, economics, and you're evaluating evidence, but you're not connecting it back to the science that drives the thing. Um, so I, I, I can see how I can see how it could go wrong. I can see why you would object to that. On the other hand, I think that that should be a key part of the cultural education that students get in school. Uh, it just maybe shouldn't be taking science lessons out necessarily. Maybe there are other things. That should, um, you, we did it, I mean, I remember doing evaluation of evidence in history lessons, and to be honest, if you haven't done the set, then evaluating the evidence pro and against GM is very like evaluating who shot the AFK, because you, you don't have the fundamental, the fundamental theory to it, you're just looking at what people said about it and what the, what the evidence is, um, and trying to evaluate it like that, which is a worthwhile thing to try and do. Yeah, I think the issue really arose because scientists were frustrated by the lack of um, clear thinking, I think, in some of yeah. the newspaper headlines. So they asked for it originally to be put in because there is no PSHCE syllabus, whereas there is a national curriculum yeah, syllabus exactly. for science. <coughs> no, and I think that's a valid attempt, and I don't think it's necessary time to give up on it, but I can see how the major flaws in the initial stage as well. So it's a shame it's gone completely. I actually did a, 
in the book run up to the LHC, I was part of a bunch of films that were funded by SDFC, the Research Council for it, called Colliding Particles, which was explicitly aimed at that part of the syllabus. Oh, I know them well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. that, that was where they were coming from. It was to try and show people what students, what, so show students what, science, what scientists did with their everyday life and, and how, and kind of demystify a little bit the Higgs discovery. <coughs> so it, it didn't have a lot of science in it, actually. It was just following us around the camera seeing what we did. And I think it was quite, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Okay, so we're moving on to the next talk of the morning session. Um.